back on the Zero Hour. This is your host, Richard R.J. Escal. My next guest, like myself, worked for Bernie Sanders on his presidential campaign. However, we worked on different campaigns. We have crossed paths over the years. I, I always enjoy uh, speaking with him. Chuck Rocha is a political consultant. He is a president of Solidarity Strategies, which is the nation's largest Latino-owned political consulting firm. He is the uh, he was the senior advisor to the Bernie Sanders 2020 campaign with a special focus on Latino outreach. And he is author of a new book. Uh, I hold it up, but it's on my Kindle, so I can't really hold up a physical object, but I've been reading it and really enjoying it. So uh, on that alone, I recommend it. It's also published by our friends at Strong Arm Press, which is another reason. But uh, Chuck Rocha, first of all, thanks for coming on the program. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. It's great to talk to you. And like I said in the introduction, I, um, I'm really enjoying this book. So, uh, And one of the reasons why I'm enjoying it is because it's written in an authentic voice, I guess the way I would say it, it's just it's a it's a real person talking, as opposed to uh, you know a lot of political books you read, which read like uh, well, no offense, but like they were written by consultants. You know what I mean? So uh, I'm really enjoying it. You talk a lot about yourself. You talk a lot about your experience with um, with with Bernie. And uh, spectacular successes on the Latino front. Hopefully, we'll be able to talk about that. But uh, I'll start with this. I mean, I know you're progressive because uh, I've known you for a while. And uh, I also know you're progressive because you worked for Bernie. But for some reason, as soon as I saw right away that you describe yourself as a Mexican redneck, I thought, you know what? I'm going to like this guy. I'm going to like this book. So uh, why don't we start there? Well, uh, why do you call yourself a Mexican redneck? Because I think, Richard, it, it encompasses uh, both of my families. I take great detail in the book, and you've probably already seen it because it's in the beginning, uh, describing my two grandmothers. I have a white grandmother uh, who raised me uh, on a working farm in East Texas. And my father, who was Mexican, who left at a really, I was only almost five years old when he left. Uh, his mother, Carmen Rocha, is a Mexican, a woman, a abuela, and uh, probably the most stereotypical Mexican grandmother you can imagine. I, I make, take great detail in the book about uh, the both of the great cooking that both of them did. Uh, I, I go on to say that's the reason I weighed 300 pounds when I graduated high school, as I had these two grandmothers who eloquently could cook either the best Southern fried chicken, my white grandmother, or tortillas and hot sauce like my Mexican grandmother grandmother. So I got to cross back and forth between these two cultures in real time, never really getting to live in either one of them because my family was mixed and we, my father and mother didn't live together. So if you meet me in person, I look a lot different than how you're hearing me on this radio. I sound like my white grandfather who raised me on that farm as redneck as redneck could be. That means I had a gun by the time I was nine. Uh, I was hunting. I was fishing. I was uh, working on tractors by the time I was 13. I was really living what most kids in rural East Texas would consider a redneck lifestyle. Uh, but then also, I'm, I'm really dark skinned as a Mexican. And I'm very much have a lot of Mexican features. I look like what you would think of as a Mexican. So Mexican redneck was just a good way for me to encompass the way I look and the way I sound. When I used to do a lot of public speaking when I worked for the unions, uh, I would always, people would be put off as soon as I would stand in front of this big room of all of these factory workers and start talking, they would assume as I walked up, they were judging me on what I looked like. And when the words came out of my mouth, it was always a good icebreaker to say, I realize I look one way and I realize I sound another. So that was how the Mexican redneck was born. You know, I related to it in a funny way because uh, e even though, you know, both my family uh, ancestries, they're, you know, European, you know, I had a Jewish grand, a uh, Jewish father, and I had, but I lived with Southern Baptist relatives at one point in my teens. So, you know, I had a bar mitzvah. Plus, I can play at a tent revival. I can play. Uh, I've got a mansion over the hilltop. You know, uh, backwards and forwards, because I used to have to play those uh, tent revivals in California. So, uh, you know, I, I related to the sort of 
I don't know how to describe it, but I feel like if you have, at the time, it felt like a disadvantage to me, right? And and this is going to get into the politics of it, because, but I, as a kid, I felt like, well, I don't belong here, and I don't belong there, and it's like, you know, I don't feel at home with the Southern Baptists because they think I'm an alien, and I, 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 I don't feel at home with the, uh, you know, with the other relatives, you know, for a different, you know, whatever. But now I look back at it and I think, well, it, 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 there was an advantage to it. I feel like I saw multiple perspectives. I realized there's more than one way of looking at a situation. And I also realized that people that are different from me, uh, they don't have to be my enemy. I might disagree with them. I might want to persuade them. I want to, might want to bring them along. But I don't know. I feel like it gave me a, a different kind of perspective, not saying better or worse, just different. And I don't know if you relate to that at all, but uh, or if that affected your politics at all. But uh, I feel like it affected mine. I don't know. What's your thinking? Uh, I go into great detail in the book, T.O. Bernie. Uh, and I'm so thankful to Strong Arm Press for helping me put this thing together because it, it talks about that piece of my upbringing. Uh, I own one of the most successful political consulting firms in the nation. And thanks to Bernie and a lot of my great clients. But I look, Richard, at the world of politics and voter contact much different than all of the very elite people who I share those powerful rooms with. I don't think that many of them uh, grew up on uh, government assistance like me. They understood what it was like when rednecks don't vote for you and how much they love their gun and why they love their guns and understanding those cultures. When I look through the lens of a working person, it's because I was one, not saying that other consultants never worked with their hands or that they had come from anything. The majority, though, of consultants all went to Harvard and Yale. They have successful families and, and, and they own their privilege. Many of them are very woke white men who help progressives get elected. They're not all bad. And I don't want to put that in right. that contextuality. But I do want to say, because I worked in a factory uh, when I started there at 19 and then joined the union and then became a union steward and then became a division chairman, I go through the book of this progression of my activism, not ever knowing that I was an activist, never knowing what an activist was and what the challenges are for this brown dude who sounds like an old white dude when he talks, who've never been to college a day in my life, who started working in a factory when I was 19, who had a baby myself when I was 20 and took full custody of my son that I raised by myself, that all of these challenges in my life, I A, overcome them. And I talk about this in the book for other young black and brown kids or broke white kid for that matter, how you can overcome that, but also how it actually constructed my, my views of politics. And I think it's made me so much better as a consultant than the consultants I work with. And I stay ahead of them a lot of times because I literally come from the demographic or that working class background that they're trying to figure out the nuance or the communication strategy to reach. When they're talking about reaching old white men who work in a factory, who are still workers, who kind of like Donald Trump, I've worked with them every day. They were my they were my workers when I was their union steward. Like I understand the culture there to you going back and forth. So I think it really just makes me a better consultant because I look at the world much differently than the your average woke white man consultant. So how did you connect? I know you talk about this in the book, but uh, how did you make that leap from uh, from guy working in a factory, which you know I relate to also it to uh, the world of political consulting i mean it's like you say it's not the usual trajectory right i mean it's, it's usually you go to a uh, ivy league school and then somebody recruits you and then you work your way up and blah 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 so what was your path it's a great great story and again it's in the book and it's a big part of the book uh and i talk about uh, a division chairman who asked me to run for union steward because I worked on the back shifts. There was not a lot of older men there. It was mainly where all the black and brown kids worked because it was nasty in the department I worked in. And he talked me into doing it. Bottom line is when he recruited me to do that job, I talk about not being an activist or not knowing anything about being an activist, but that I did something that was very self-serving for me. He explained to me, and there's a funny part in the book where he says, well, Chuck, I understand you don't want to do this job because you're busy loading the machine and every 50 seconds, these belts move up. And I would literally, I'm kind of a big guy. I would take these big hay hooks and I would grab bales of rubber and I'd throw it on a conveyor belt. And after I throw two bales on, I could sit down and wait for 45 more seconds till it was time for the next batch of rubber. 
So I told the dude, look, I, I've got this great job and I'm making 20 bucks an hour. I've got Cadillac Union Healthcare. I've got a defined pension. And all I got to do is sit on that rubber cutter and load that machine for eight hours and I'm good. He looked at me and said, Chuck, if you need to do union business, if you're a union steward, the union will pay somebody to come in on overtime to do your job for you. And I was like, sign me up. That sounds like a good thing for me. I don't have to load the machine and I still get paid. Now I talk about it in the book that that doesn't sound like somebody who's progressive and somebody who cares about his fellow man. And I will be honest with you. I didn't like, I didn't know I did. I did, but I didn't know I did. Uh, and so I did something that was very self-serving that opened the door for me to be like, Oh, this union thing is cool. Like I'm really good at, at representing workers and fighting for them. And then many, many, many years later, and I talk about this, I realized that when my daddy left, I, I became like the guardian of my mother and my sister who came along a few years after me, I was this big overgrown hayseed plow boy. And I had this little hundred pound mother. And as I said, I weighed 200 pounds by the time I was in the eighth grade, A, because of mama was cooking, but B, because I was throwing hay bales on a farm. So you got this enormously big, strong kid who's having to protect his mother from her boyfriends and my sisters from bullies at school. Then I go to high school. I become an offensive lineman where I'm protecting the quarterback. I make all state as football player because I'm strong and all the things that the farm will, will make you. And all of that made sense later in life. And I was like, I was doing the same thing at the union. Like once I became the union steward, I just went into a natural mode of protection because that's all I'd ever known was protecting vulnerable people around me. And that's where it all started. So I become a union steward. Then guess what? You know this, Richard. If I'm the junior union steward and the local Democratic Party needs tables and chairs for the meeting, the union president gets the most junior guy at the union to haul the tables and chairs. So that was me because I was 20 years old. So then I started showing up at the Smith County uh, Democratic Party because that's where I had to pick up the tables and chairs from. And I'd sit in the meetings. and I'd be like, well, this thing is pretty cool. And this is oh, this is Oh, I see. So I started getting involved in the local party. Then I started knocking on doors. And then I started you know, being a precinct chairman. I became the precinct chairman in my local precinct because I was in a meeting to pick up the chairs. And they were like, does anybody want to be the precinct chairman at precinct 44 at the volunteer fire department? That was my home district. Nobody wanted. I was like, sure, they'll give me off work to go be the, the precinct judge for the election day. So I did that. So that all led to me getting picked up by the AFL CIO in 1996 to do the very first labor 96 program when uh, Sweeney and Trumpka took over the AFL and that springboarded me to work for the international then start my own firm. This just all of this goes is told in very much more detail in the book. So, all right, that's a great story. And again, we're talking with uh, Chuck Rocha, who is the author of the new book, T.O. Bernie. Uh, so you go into political consulting. I think that's around the time, well, maybe a few years later, but you and I cross paths at Netroots Nation or whatnot, you know, judging the Pundits Cup or whatever we did. And uh, and then um, how did you make the connection with uh, with uh, T.O. Bernie? You know, it's again, it's one good story after another. Richard, me and you've done this a long time. It's all about who you know and being at the right place at the right time. I like to tell people that I'm a brilliant strategist and that all this was part of a master plan. But to be honest, I just lucked into most of it. And I tell most of my friends I'm more lucky than I am good. And well, I left the story steel workers. And I tell the story about leaving the steel workers and starting a firm because I was aggravated that there were no women, no people of color really working at the most senior levels of politics and uh, even in the progressive movement for that matter. So I wanted to start something different. So I started this firm and I had known Bernie Sanders because I had been the international political director for the steel workers for 11 years. He was a stalwart with us on trade. He was a stalwart with us on protecting workers' rights. Anything that had to do with protecting workers, Bernie Sanders was always in our camp. So I knew of him. I tell the story in the book about meeting him for the first time uh, when I was doing a citizen lobbying, when I was still in the local union, when I brought me to DC, and you'll remember this, Richard, a bunch of unions were on the hill uh, fighting against something called fast track authority. Right. Right after NAFTA. So I was part of that lobbying effort that were uh, unions, especially manufacturing unions like mine, funny enough, making Goodyear tires, Donald Trump, uh, that that's where I worked at. So we were up saying what this would do to us if we did this uh, story to all your listeners out there. Eight years after that passed, 10 years after that passed, my factory shut down and moved to China. Like we were fighting for the lives and we lost the fight. And the repercussions of that is they shut my factory down that made money. That was a profitable plant. 
but because we made the smaller radial passenger tires, they moved my manufacturing plant to China because they could ship a lot of those smaller tires in boats cheaper than they could the farm tires. Little known fact, the only tires that are left made in America are big uh, truck tires and tractor tires because they're so heavy, they cost more to ship. So they just assume make them here, right? So that's just how that goes down. I tell the story in the book about meeting Bernie Sanders for the first time in person at a Chinese restaurant uh, with Leo Gerard when I'm the political director talking about trade fights. So that's the, the first time uh, that I actually meet him. And in the book, I talk about him referencing the first time we met. And he always likes bringing that story up uh, when we do when we do work together. Well, and again, we're talking with Chuck Rocha, uh, author of the book, uh, T.O. Bernie on uh, on Strong Arm Press. So you did. So you joined the campaign, and it's. I think it's fair to say you were the point person on Latino outreach, and uh, you talk in the book about Nevada being the must-win state, and we got to you know, and there was this uh, you know debacle in uh, Iowa, and uh, there was. Uh, um, well, there was something else, but what was the state between Iowa and Nevada? You talk about uh, New it? Hampshire, and I should be saying Nevada, right? Because Nevada. I'm already like and, and just, New just Hampshire. disqualifying myself, Nevada. Um, and I wrote a, a little bit about the Nevada caucus because of the uh, uh, Union Health Plan there. I analyzed the whole fight over the uh, uh, the culinary workers plan there. But um, tell us about what, what happened there in Nevada. You know, it was a crazy time. Um, and I, I was so lucky to be in the position that I was in as a senior advisor and all senior advisors for all you folks listening at home. When somebody says they're a senior advisor on a campaign, if you want to really find out if they have any power, find out if they're in the room with the candidate, A, and then find out if they have budgetary authority. If they don't have either one, then they're just a hanger owner who's just around uh, running their mouth and nobody's really listening to them. That's no disrespect. Well, I'm going to interrupt you to say go Good thing my title wasn't senior advisor when I was with Bernie. Uh, it was not. So, right. uh, Eric, okay. And, and you know what I'm getting at, Richard. You have all these people saying, I'm advising this, yeah, right? 100%. And the only reason that I got the, the Latino program turned out what it was is that Jeff Weaver and Bernie trusted me to run the whole paid operation. So I was in charge of the English work as well, all the mail, all the radio, all of the literature, like when they brought me in to do that. But I knew from the beginning that we needed to do a special F emphasis on these Latino voters. A, if you have the person who's the senior most operative in DC in the Latino community, which is me and my firm, I have a whole team of Latinos on my consulting firm who I literally moved over to the Bernie Sanders campaign because I needed senior staff around me. So we had been the architect of putting this together for the whole time. So we were doing things that none of the other campaigns I knew would do and then doing them in great detail. Uh, and I outline all this in the part you're talking about in Nevada, where he called it the crown jewel. And I will take you back in time. It's very painful for me, but to where we won Iowa and got 3000 more votes than Pete Buttigieg, but because of the way that that crazy system works, they said Pete won Iowa. So not only did we lose that piece of the narrative, but Richard knows this, we probably based off of what our digital team told me probably lost $2 million of fundraising that night because we couldn't declare ourselves a winner. It's just horrible. And then as soon as that happened, I was on the plane that night, uh, the next morning with Bernie and the team, and we flew on the private uh, charter, which we didn't do that much, but we had to be directly into New Hampshire. So I'm on the plane with Bernie, we get to New Hampshire, and we literally decided in a conference room in the little small cheap hotel that Bernie always made us stay in, uh, of how the budget was going to come down now that we had lost that money to be able to fund through Nevada and Super Tuesday. So I put you in the room when that happens. And then everybody else stays in New Hampshire. This is a this is an important part of the book. And I was like, I'm out of here, Jeff. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, there's nothing for me to add. If you can't win New Hampshire without me, this campaign is over. I've got to go protect our flank, which is a must win for us because of what we've done with Latinos. I'm getting on a plane to go home and unpack and repack and take my butt to Nevada. So we, I go to Nevada way in advance. New Hampshire is still a week out and I land in Nevada with the unbelievable amount of pressure. I opened the book with what I'm feeling and the unbelievable pressure. Now we had 
kicked everybody's back in in Iowa with Latinos and done something nobody thought we could do. So the expectations were through the roof for a place like Nevada. Richard will tell you that the Culinary Union had come out with a no endorsement when they were ready to endorse Biden, but because he was doing so bad, they didn't. They just want to make sure that they knew that this Medicare for all thing might not have been for their members, that they had negotiated collective bargaining, a great agreement with the casinos that where they had collective bargaining. So they were anti uh, the health care for all. And it really come across as anti Bernie, but it was mainly just the leadership of the union. I describe in great detail how I go around the leadership of the culinary union to talk directly to their members for over six months to deliver all of their members for Bernie Sanders when it came to caucus day. All of these are kind of like inside baseball strategies that nobody would have ever thought. Keep in mind now, I give no disrespect to the culinary union, one of the most powerful unions in America. But because I came out of the labor movement and I'm an old organizer, I knew how to organize around the leadership. So we went directly to talking to the members. So on caucus day in uh, Nevada, on you had these uh, strip caucuses. That means that they held them uh, in casinos on the strip so the workers could come. You had all the leadership and the stewards in one corner with Joe Biden. You had literally all the membership on the other side with Bernie. And I've got great pictures of the members and the leadership fighting with each other in the room. And I've literally created all that because I had talked to the average culinary union member 22 times by caucus day, which nobody ever knew about till I read this, read this, I mean, writ this book, wrote, excuse me, this book. So, uh, you know, and that kind of stuff, I got to say, uh, Chuck Rocha is that's the real excitement of politics, right? right? I mean, that's, you know, you can't beat that for an adrenaline rush among other things and, uh, and for an excellent cause. And it's also worth mentioning for people who might not remember that, uh, you know, the Nevada caucus for Nevada caucus for, uh, uh, for Bernie in 2016 was rough. And there were a lot of accusations that Bernie supporters had said, speak English to Spanish speakers, which didn't happen. But there was accusation that, you know, it got very contentious. And, and um, I mean, that what you guys did there is uh, a great piece of work and also repairing, you know, what I thought was going to be some da lingering damage that uh, you seem to get past. Let's remind everybody that not only was Iowa a little bit of a debacle last time for us, but these strip caucuses are for the culinary union, for the workers of those casinos to have a place to go caucus on caucus day so they can leave work. And in 2016 with Hillary Clinton, I was in one of those caucuses. And I should have said this in the beginning, but I worked for Bernie Sanders in 15 and 16. And during the first presidential run, uh, I was an advisor. Uh, I wasn't in Burlington, but I was doing a lot of the work. We didn't do near what we did in 2020. But I remember being in the Caesars Palace strip caucus when Bill Clinton come walking in and all the culinary unions was just parading in behind him. They were all waving signs and flags. And I turned to look to Jeff Weaver and I was like, this thing is over. They have just out organized us and y'all didn't even see it coming. And to that point, we lost every single strip caucus location in 2016 to Hillary Clinton. She cleaned our plow. There are seven strip caucuses in all the big casinos of, uh, I'll go, I ain't going through all of them, but like Bellagio, Caesars, Rio, uh, Rio Bally's, all of them have one. There's seven of them. We lost all seven. Flash forward, lessons learned, Chuck Rocha on the ground doing some old school guerrilla union organizing and then running a very robust Latino program on caucus day uh, after 2020, we win five caucuses, we tie in one and lost just one. So the amount of, of, of space we made up in that short amount of time, which is two years, let's just say that we weren't going to get our butt whooped again because I had learned the lessons and I knew the key was getting to um, the members. And most of the members for you listening who may not understand the culinary union, they're a heavy, heavily immigrant union. Uh, half of them aren't even eligible to vote. But the half that are eligible to vote, they vote in high propensity because they're very motivated by the union and they have a great communication infrastructure to, to turn them out because they've negotiated these great uh, benefits and, and working conditions in these casinos. So I knew and you think about this. I write about this in the book. It was one of my secret strategies to get to the members. Every time you go stay in a hotel, whether you're in Vegas or you're in wherever uh, and you get up in the morning 
you brush your teeth. You said you're going to go down to the breakfast buffet and have a little breakfast and you come back from there. And sometimes you interrupt your maid or your cleaning lady or your cleaning person who's been in your room first because you're at the end of the hall where they're starting to clean. And if you think about what's happening in that room and as an old organizer, I would always be at learning, you know, uh, about what's around you and what these workers are doing. They've got your sheets pulled back. They're in a really job that they hate doing every single day. But most of the time it's a Latino or some ethnic person cleaning your room. And normally they've got your bedside radio turned on with the music turned up and they're listening to the music that they love while they're cleaning your room to probably escape from whatever their problems are for the day, especially in Nevada uh, or in a casino in Vegas. Can you imagine having to clean hotel rooms in Vegas after stupid people have destroyed your hotel rooms? Well, if you're in Nevada, I know that 80% of those women or men are Latinos and they're listening to Mexican music while they clean that room. So what nobody knew was for five months, Richard, I was advertising heavily on that radio station, talking to those workers all through the day on why Bernie Sanders was good for them. I'm talking about I spent one million dollars on Spanish radio. And during the day when other people aren't buying radio because they say it's not drive time radio, I was buying that cheap Spanish radio in the middle of the day where I own the radio stations for like $5 an ad. That's the strategy behind this thing and the organizing that nobody saw, which is the heart of the T.O. Bernie book. You know, when I, uh, that, that's great. And when I was learning uh, or trying to learn Spanish, Many years ago, by the way, I used to listen to Mexican radio and, and uh, just imitate the uh, announcers. Sure. It's you know, a beautiful my melody with that music, right? And if you're doing I a love that music, music. I, I'm, a musician. To a place. I, I, I'm a musician and I love that music a lot. I hitchhiked around Mexico with a guitar when I was a, uh, in college. And I just just with the guitar, I would meet people and, you know, mm -hmm. they would invite me to dinner and everything. So, yeah. No, I get what a powerful uh, strategy that is. So, and again, we're talking with Chuck Rocha, whose book is T.O. Bernie. Um, so Bernie did really well overall with the Latino population, not just in Nevada, right, but ever, everywhere. Um, just before I let you go, Chuck, how do you think Biden's uh, Latino strategy and overall the Democrats' Latino strategy, how do you think that's going? I think that and I know you're not just Latino, by the way. I'm not trying to. No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. You, but I, that. I, I, am I tell a great story in this book about how the first job I ever had with Bernie Sanders in 2015 was being the Mexican who uh, translated his website to Spanish for a guy uh -huh. named uh, uh, Scott Goodstein. And it turned out to turn into millions of dollars worth of work because Bernie trusted me and I proved myself to Bernie and Bernie trusted me. Hence why he asked me to be the manager. But to your point, Democrats are horrible at doing this work. And, it, and people ask me all the time, why are Democrats so bad at it? Well, it's because the same people have run all these campaigns over 20 years, Richard. If you know, like I know, because we've been doing this a long time, it's the same group of elite establishment consultants who run everything when you get to a certain level of money. I like to say the diversity ends where the money begins. And that's just how it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you'll have a lot of great people of color, brown people, black people working on state rep races and city council. But once once you get to big races where there's big money to be had, there are no brown people or black people in the room helping making strategic decisions. That's not because Democrats are racist in any way. Uh, it, Democrats are very open and, and, and are on the right side of history on many things. It's just the consulting world and the elite campaign management world has not kept up with the demographic shift. And because of that, you have these most of them well-meaning woke white consultants who are like, let's just do this or let's do a little relational organizing or run some Spanish TV that we Google translated and everything will be fine. What I proved with T.O. Bernie, the book, is that if you do a, a, a layered approach, that means you do Spanish and English digital to young Latinos. You do TV and digital to older Latinos. You do those old weekly Spanish newspapers for your Mexican grandmothers that they read and they get at the market every Sunday, right? You do Pandora ads that are on somebody's iPhone instead of terrestrial radio because it's just over consuming in places where the radio market hadn't kept track with the growth of the demographic. These nuances are a big part of how you do it, but no other consultants normally will take the time to really try to orchestrate and put together the matrix of what that should really look like. And then you salt in the difference between a Cuban, a Venezuelan, a Puerto Rican, a Mexican, 
Mexican and a, Demo a, a, a Dominican, then you have a whole new set of problems that you have to fix based off of state by state demography. No, I think that's a great explanation. And, you know, all I would add, and you do this, Chuck Rocha, is and talk to people like they're people and you're a person and talk to them like human beings. You know, right. I mean, it, it shouldn't be so damn complicated, but the consultant world seems to want to make it complicated. Let me make one last point, Richard. And you just reminded me is that the consultant world also in all campaigns, micro targeted universes down to be very small. Right. They just want to talk to super frequent, super turnout voters because they consider it a better investment for return on investment. With Bernie, you'll be proud to know this, Richard. When I did the targeting, I added in all the newly registered Latinos and infrequent Latinos and Latinos that maybe just vote in general elections. And once we found we could have a conversation with them, guess what? Half of them turned up because they had said we're the first ones who had ever asked them to participate in a primary or a caucus. So your point of just go ask them was exactly right. Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, exactly. So I have nothing to add to that, uh, except that I do want to remind listeners that the book is T.O. Bernie. It's available on Strong Arm Press. Uh, the author, my guest, Chuck Rocha, R-O-C-H-A. I'm on a new thing of spelling all my That's uh, guest name because I, I get trashed on, on social media for this whole time. Uh, he's Chuck is the president of Solidarity Strategies. And as I say, uh, the author of the new book, T.O. Bernie, go buy it. And Chuck, uh, great talking to you. Thanks for coming on the program. Thank you, Richard. We'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.